open to the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 16 to 19. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, son of Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is not a papal sermon, don't worry. Every time I hear that, all I think of is the papal, but then again, papal. Pope, sorry. I realized I was saying something kind of weird. Papal. Papal. Thank you. At least somebody speaks English in here. <laughs> not me, don't worry. No complaints about that. When we look at Christ, there's this image, this name for Christ of the cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And last week we talked about Jesus. He goes into the temple and he shakes things up. He flips over pews. He curses a fig tree. He generally starts to go after Israel. Starts to go after a religion that is beautiful. If you've ever looked at Judaism, it, it's beautiful. It's, you have all this imagery, you have these, this temple that everyone in the world wants to see, you have this Ark of the Covenant, you have this law book that came from the very hand of God, and you have a beautiful tree. You have a beautiful religion that was built and to look beautiful. And from the outside, I have to say, Judaism looked a whole lot better than anything else. It had an image that in comparison, we don't really match up to. Because you read through Hebrews and it says that our covenant is better. We'd admit that, right? Christianity is better than Judaism. But it goes back to the reason. It doesn't say, oh, we're better because da da da. It goes back to one reason repeatedly. And we talk about a cornerstone, and the problem is none of us have a clue what a cornerstone is. We lay cement now. We use wood. We have a foundation. And if we call Christ our foundation, then we get the image. And honestly, if I had to compare this tree to the tree I made for y'all, it's beautiful, don't lie. <laughs> if I had to compare that tree to this tree, well, they're the same height. I know this, this is part of the base. Don't worry. This is part of this lovely tree. They're the same height. I'm going to have to say that one looks a whole lot better. Ruth does a better job decorating the church than I do. So it's all their prayers. I decorate the church and it looks just like that. <clears throat> and they're the same height. It doesn't look it. I had to double measure because I thought I was going to lie today. And I try not to lie. But those are the same height. That's a prettier tree. It's an organized tree. It's, you don't have a hodgepodge. You don't have the oddness that you have with the church. Where, where God takes a whole world and says, you're my nation. And we go, nation? But we live in America. We live in Canada, we live in Mexico, we live in, name where you live, that's our nation. And yet he says, he calls them all from all the nations of the world to make this church, this beautiful church. And the church is in pieces. We have this foundation that is essential, this foundation that can never be moved, which is Christ that elevates the church to far superior to anything in Judaism. But you notice there's this little gap. Did you know that Jesus never wrote something? You know, 
said. He wrote something on the sand, but we really don't know what it was. So we really have nothing, and we have this, this gap here. This gap of the church historical, as I call it. The church historical. They gave us the gospel. They gave us the letters. They gave us the teachings. They gave us how things are done. They gave us practices. And all these beautiful things. And then we're this goofy tree at the top. And today we're going to discuss the radical difference between what we try to make Christianity look like and what Christianity really looks like. We're going to put these stories in context. And today we are in Mark chapter 12. And I want you there, mainly so you don't think I'm making things up. Partly because, I don't know, I could read from the wrong chapter. And if you don't go, uh, 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 I won't notice. Today we are in Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> and we begin with a radical difference. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a tower, and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him, and beat him, and sent him away into the end. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And with many others, some they beat, some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They would respect my son. Finally, he sent to them, saying, They would respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to the others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him. But fear the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. It's an attack. It's a blanket attack from Christ. The people that are being killed and being mistreated are the prophets. God builds them this religion, writes it in stone, gives it to them from Sinai, and then sends their prophets to draw them back to that. They depart and get their king, and then the kings get worse and worse and worse until there's nothing good left. And what's he do? He, he's built them this vineyard, this beautiful religion, and what did they do? They mistreated everyone that was sent to them. The prophets of old were mistreated. Some were killed. Some were beaten. But the thing was, they were not willing to give up on something they had already corrupted. They had already gotten away from, and we see Christ here doing something. He is being the Lord. Verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes said the Christ is the son of David. David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great thong heard him grab him. So the idea that he's Lord, he's coming and he's declaring himself to be Lord and he's He's taking what they considered to be so holy, it did come from the hand of God. And he takes it, and last week we talked about he challenged it to the extreme by clearing the temple and cursing them through a fig tree and saying that 
They aren't bearing fruit. He's going to take them out. They will be dead. And then he asks them the question, how do your teachings, your twisting of what the law was, fit? Because you said the Messiah is the son of David. Jesus comes from the land king. And so he asks them, how do you say that the Christ is the son of David? And he declares himself Lord. By the words of David saying that the Lord said to my Lord. And these little stories start to come together. Verse 38. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. <coughs> you look at Christianity, and we get some weird figures. You look at Judaism, you've got this priest, this high priest, this representative. You have this man who goes into the Holy Holies. You have this beautiful outward image. These men who give money, and they give a lot of money to support this expensive temple, this expensive way of life. And what does Jesus say? He says, you know what? Look at those if you want. Let me warn you, they're scribes. They go around in long robes, desiring honor. And instead of just cursing the fig tree, he replaces the fig tree. But he replaces it with what? A widow. This story goes along with the story before it because what is it? Those were mistreating widows. And he says, no, 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 no. Christianity is the opposite. Christianity is about that widow. It's not about those men who are neglecting the widow to have this beautiful religion. It's about those <coughs> widows who are giving out of their poverty. And you see this contrast, these scribes who devour widows versus these widows who are models of the church. You mentioned a story today, and I love the story because all nations shall call her blessed. I didn't write that, just so you know. When she comes before Elizabeth, how am I worthy that the mother of my Lord should be here? And you take a step back and you begin to think about it. Mary. You ever notice in the Bible that we never talk about a certain figure? Jesus' earthly parent. That's male. You ever notice this? There's Joseph and Mary, and then there's Mary. Mary. At the crucifixion, it's pretty clear that Jesus is sending John to go take care of her. Nobody knows she's a widow. And then when they go to offer the sacrifice, even before Joseph has died, they don't bring the proper sacrifice. There's a prescribed sacrifice whenever you have a child, and they bring the, okay, you can do this if you can't afford the regular one. They brought the doves. Cheap. Penny doves. Aren't they sold for three of them for two pennies? Or one of them for one penny? They knew a good deal back then. But what you have is 
I changed from a man who goes into the temple to a woman who gets to be the temple. That's something we talk about a lot because, I don't know, we're not comfortable with Mary. But what happened? She was the temple of God. Otherwise, you've got to say that Jesus is not God. And I'm a little uncomfortable with you right now. And so what do you have? You have this change from this religion to this religion, and you know what? Does it look weird or what? And he ends with talking about the tree and how it's so different. He puts in the middle this, this declaration, you know, this presentation of how he's Lord and how you're misunderstanding it. Let me explain how it really works. Yes, he's the Christ. Yes, he comes from David, but that's not the point. And this early church explains to us that he's the Trinity. One of those terms, not in Scripture, but the church taught us that he's really Lord. But the only thing that elevates this above that is what I used to represent Christ. This foundation. This foundation that is the church, and without Christ, uh, everything else is meaningless, loses all hope, loses all joy. You can't even know salvation in a church without Christ as a foundation. And this connecting of this church that's so beautiful and so different, and we really like that one. I don't know how many of us are honest enough to say it. We really like that religion. We like a religion that is neat and tidy. You know, you, you went to the Jewish synagogue, and guess what people look like? Jews. That was easy. Okay. You don't show up and people look different than you. You don't show up and people talk different than you. You don't show up and have to deal with the widows being examples. You get this beautiful priest to look at who neglects widows. And our religion can slowly begin to look like that very thing that Christ came and cursed and got rid of and took out and did everything he could to remind us, don't go back to that. To give us something beautiful. Because I, I made this tree for y'all because I was like, that's about how I view the church. You've got some leaves that I found outside. I don't know, a leaf from another leaf. There's some plastic leaves. I put flowers on it because I like flowers. There's some grapes because sometimes I get hungry. I don't know what that thing is on the left. <laughs> There's a weird looking thing in the middle too. And I want you to begin to see the church a little differently. One, that you don't take out the middle of the church. We, we like to. We like to say we go straight back to Christ. Well, you know what we've got from Jesus? I'm finished. Don't worry. That was it. He never wrote to me. People wrote about him. The early church wrote about him. We don't have the Bible for 100, 200 years. And then this church teaches us and it grows and it flourishes and it's this beautiful base that we stand on. And we don't want it. We don't, we don't want these things. We don't. But we want a neat religion that can be Put in a picture and go, if you see one of those leaves, you know what the rest of them look like. That one makes sense. It's atomically correct. I don't know how to use that word. There was a word there, so you know what it was. All those leaves are the same. They generally fit together. It looks nice. But if I offered you a religion that was completely different and said, it starts with this story of a young maiden becoming the temple of God. Now all of us go, I'm uncomfortable, we don't talk about Mary here. Remember that whole, this is not a papal sermon? 
It's not supposed to be. But because we've hated on something so much, we kind of throw out everything to do with it. And we try to make it real neat like that. But the problem is, how many of y'all think about the widows? I, I, I love this church for a reason. And I talk about this church in high regard. But I have a sneaking favorite about this church. Do you know how many widows we have? Our widows take care of each other. Our widows reach out. Our widows make phone calls. They write cards. They invite people. They hug visitors. They do all kinds of things. And you know what? As the models of our church, they're pretty awesome. As the examples that Jesus is using when he's going, this poor woman put in a penny. Oh, they're putting their, their, their bokus, bokus of dollars. She put in a penny. Isn't she amazing? Because honestly, a lot of us can say, well, widows don't usually have that much money. But yet we look at our widows here, and what do we say? We say, you know what? That's what Jesus wants us to look like. That's what Jesus saw the church as. Jesus saw the church in a poor widow woman. This whole passage is about that change from one to the other. He's finally coming out and he's saying, you know, what you've got in Judaism is not what I want for you. What you're used to is not what I want you to have. And that's where we go back to being Israel and he keeps sending it to us and saying, why don't you go back to it? It, it? We live in a society where I can't say what I'm fixing to say without offending somebody, so get ready to be offended. Take off your shoes if you want so I can step on them. Whatever you want. Jesus only built one church. I, I didn't write that, by the way. It's in Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. One body. One. The church is the bride of Christ. He's not polygamous, digamous, or whatever word you'd like to use today. I guess it'd be poly, since it'd be more than two. He's not. Christ is not a polygamous. He's monogamous. Christ is married to one bride. The church. And the church has a foundation and should always be able to track back down and to go down and should be, you know what? We hold to what the early church gave us because the early church held close, so close to that foundation because they were built on that foundation. And we go back to them. And we go back to the early church. And we go back to the early church. Because guess what? That is our connection to Christ. And not throwing out everything because we just like something. Because our temptation is to make our churches look like that. Talk about how beautiful everything is. If I want to tell you how beautiful this church is, I can think of some names. Nadine. Rosemary. Ruth. I think it's, I, I'll tell you about my beautiful church. If you want to know about it, I'll tell you all about it. I can go on. I, I love the fact that there are so many godly widows here. And I need to tell you, that makes us pretty awesome. Or at least that's the ones we should be looking for. How awesome are our widows? Amazing. So today we have an invitation. Because I hate to say it, outside the church there is no salvation. Oops, that one's not popular either. <coughs> There's not. Because the church is what's founded on Christ and outside of Christ and His body. Sorry, you're outside His body. If you're not a member with Him, you're not united with Him, guess what? There's no hope outside of Christ. None of us are so good that we wouldn't need to be in His body to be fixed. Now, there's probably atheists out there who are less sinful than me. I will admit that in a heartbeat. I at least know what I'm doing. I know the rules enough to know that I'm sinning. There you go. So I can admit that I'm more sinful than them. But neither one of us is safe because we're less sinful than the other. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there is one body, one spirit. Just as you are called to the one hope. How many hopes? 
One hope. I was making sure. One hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Ooh. Lord. There's one. And today we offer an invitation of how he said to give his mind. We know we are baptized into Christ. It's the only entry. As much as we'd like to be open and loving, we can't change what he said. They were baptized into it. We're going to leave the invitation simple and just say that if you're not in him, Doesn't apply to you. You need to be in Christ before you have the hope that comes with knowing that one day you are with the Father. And that we'll go to be with those who are in the church and be with that Christ. If there's anybody who needs to respond to that because you're outside of Christ and you don't have that hope, or if there's anybody who needs prayers of the congregation, or there's something that keeping you from being loyal to God as your one Lord. Or if there's anybody who wishes to submit to the elders, we ask you to come now as we stand, as we sing.